Let's start today's gen session and for the start, allow me to greet our dear colleagues and guests from United Kingdom. Uh, to be precise, from the Sari Center for Law and Philosophy, which is one kind of, uh, as Ambrose explained me, uh, a research unit inside the University of Sari School of Law. Uh, I will introduce shortly our uh, today's reporters or lecturers. Uh, we have a small change in the schedule because uh, instead of Dr. Asgirson, uh, we hear today uh, Professor Veronica Rodriguez Blanco, uh, Dr. Ambrose Lee, and online uh, we will participate uh, Professor Ken Ehrenberg. Uh, Professor Veronica Rodriguez Blanco always wo was our guest in Belgrade. First time it was online when when it was it is uh, unusual form of participating some 12 years ago maybe uh, but today when it is usual form of participating uh, she is with us thank you for being here I was in person here yes later yes oh. yes okay thank you <laughs> uh, okay just few data about uh, professor uh, rodriguez blanco she's professor in moral and political philosophy jurisprudence in the School of Law, University of Sari. She is the author of the monograph, Law and Authority under the Guise of the Good, where she argues that the understanding of the structure of practical reasons sheds light on legal authority and normativity. Veronica is also co-editor of the well-known journal, Jurisprudence, International Journals of Legal and Political Thought, Area of Care Research Interests, Archival Law, Theory, Practical Reason, and Law, Authority, and Normativity. Our second speaker for today is dear colleague Dr. Ambrose Lee. Uh, Ambrose is senior lecturer in legal theory at the School of Law, also from Sari and research fellow at the Sari Center for Law and, and Philosophy. Area of his research interests are criminal justice, moral and legal responsibility, law and authority, legal and moral luck. And last but not the least, Professor Ken Ehrenberg, our third speaker for today, professor of jurisprudence and philosophy. He is also co-director with Krafne, as, as much as I know, co-director co of the Sari Center for Law and Philosophy. Area of his research interests are jurisprudential methodology, legal ontology, legal authority, and normativity, and legal validity. Uh, okay, before I give the floor for the first speaker, Professor Veronica, let me make uh, just a few brief remarks about our official topic for today, today's jam session, namely about practical rationality. One of my permanent impressions about practicing lawyers was always that a good number of them look like our ancestors who for centuries shared Ptolemy's theory that the earth is the center of the universe. <laughs> As you know, until the appearance of Copernicus heliocentric theory, the people believe that the sun and other, other celestial bodies revolves around the earth and not the other way around. Moreover, they thought it was so obvious that people could not imagine any other what do I want to say by using this analogy? That is, by mentioning Ptolemy's lawyer, if I, have, I, I may have liberty to call them. 
On the one hand, Ptolemy's lawyers are right when they say that the majority of legal events are related to earthly legal content of positive valid law. And that this is what interests ordinary men or women and has the most significant impact on his or her life. After all, is it obvious to everyone, just as it is obvious that the sun revolves around the earth, that even oppressive legal systems were effective and in some, although perhaps defective way, legal. However, what Ptolemy's lawyers ignore is, and that is the point of the analogy, that the positive law is not the center of practical life and that a careful look beyond the boundaries of the positive law brings insights just as important for our understanding and functioning of the law as the discovery of the heliocentric system brought for astronomy. The positive valid law for sure is to a certain degree autonomous system of rules and practices, but it is not a completely independent system. And not everything that exists in our practical universe is related to it alone. Actually, I'm sure that the law is not in the center of this kind of universe. There is something out there. If you know about this series, X-Files, something is out there. There is something out there what deserves attention and scrutiny and even more what plays and should play an important role, a role in our legal world. What is this out there thing? It is the question which can be answered, answered, answered only by philosophy and philosophy of law. And I guess, maybe wrongly, that in this moment we can hear some of Ptolemy's lawyers who are screaming, oh no, Camel Nose is in our tent. I'm guessing that it would be their reaction because, in my experience, at least, there are many practicing lawyers who do not care much about philosophy of law and philosophy in the law, or even have a repulsive view about it. But the, perhaps the best answer to such objections and worries can be found in one sentence on the website of the center, of your center, from Asari. Quote. The center is committed to the idea that the study of law is deepened when grounded in philosophical principle. And I emphasize this, and philosophy is of greater benefit to society than relevant to pressing practical and legal issues. End of quote. Or as it was shortly said by, by Kant, there is nothing more practical than a good theory, or I would and in this context, a good theory of practical rationality. As an illustration of this practical purpose of theory of practical rationality, I'm going to mention just two among many, many other issues in the legal world which can profit from ideas about practical rationality. And both are uh, very practical. First, it is easy to imagine a solution to, uh, individual, to an individual legal case that fits within a broader context of legal reasons. For instance, fits within accepted interpretative practices or canons uh, or solutions by legal doctrine, etc., etc. But at the same time, violates the rudimentary uh, sense of justice and fairness. Obviously, substantive ingredient in these kind of cases is missing. And this ingredient can be supplied only by theory of practical rationality. Besides, there are cases where legal reason in the broadest sense of the world completely ran out. For instance, the court must make a decision in a specific hard case, but it cannot ground it on authoritative legal reasons from the sources of law, or can find an answer to the question of law of these cases in other others permissive sources of law. Only way to reach reasonable and rational solution in such 
kind of cases is to conceive of legal reasoning as a sort of general practical reasoning. Of course, as I said, there are many other important problems in our legal world which should be analyzed in the broader framework of universal practical rationality. But uh, do not worry, I stop here and give the floor, floor to our first speaker for today, Professor Veronica Rodriguez Blanco. Floor is yours. Thank you very much. It is a real pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I feel like with friends and at home. Thank you for the three institutions who cleverly have uh, advanced this project. Thank you, Professor, for your wonderful uh, presentation and your thoughtful views. So today, we, you are within this, the so-called section of the project that is called Law and Practical Reason. So I'm going to give us some flavor of what I think practical reason is and the complexity of the different fields and thinking that you can develop from what is called practical reason. So I guess all of you, all of you have read at some point Hart's The Concept of Law. Um, could you raise your hand if you have read it? Yes? And study. Beautiful. Wonderful. Yes, so that's a, that's a very good place to start. So we know that, um, in a way, actually Hart advanced the view that law has to do something with social practice. Essential is a practice. And he develops what is called the internal point of view. Now, as we know, practices, there are different kinds of practices, religious practices, legal practices, social practices, sport practices. But practices have something within them. They are constituted by so-called actions. So now the question is what an action is. And this is going to be very important for the law because it will bring some reflection in the most interesting fields, I think, about the law. It brings reflections on what is called the authority of law, the rule of law, the so-called international law, and the transnational order. So what is an action? And this is what I'm going to try to answer today. Because to say that the law is constituted by social practices doesn't seem sufficient to really understand what is going on in the court and what the judges are doing. And what is the nature of the authority of law? That's the argument. So let me start saying that there are two views of what an action is. So the paradigmatic concept of an action is so-called intentional action. So there is the contemporary view of what an intentional action is. And according to the contemporary view, we are organized in action, is organized into two main components, a cognitive component and the movement of your body. And within the cognitive component, you have a pair that is so-called the desire-belief pair. And the idea is that the desire belief causes the movement of your actions. So for example, when you see man standing up in the parliament, the theory of action, the contemporary theory of action, mainly advocated by a philosopher, an American philosopher who worked in Berkeley in the 50s, called Donald Davison, he thinks that the belief, your belief and your desires cause the movement of your actions. So for example, when man is stand up in parliament, the the belief to approve the statue and the desire to approve the statue cause the standing up and raising their hands and approving the statue. So within this view, if the pair belief and desire causes the movement of our actions, then somehow action is inserted into the natural world. However, we cannot say that there are psychophysical laws that explain the regularity. There is an anomalous monism between desires and beliefs and what causes the movement of our actions. Within this contemporary view, we could actually attribute to others mental states. So we could say, I know me or drag yeah, is going to take up, up the coffee because you have the belief and the desire so he just said to me that he wants to grab a coffee. He has the desire to grab a cup of coffee. He believes that the cup of coffee is in the kitchen and he has just stood up. So I can attribute to me a drag the action, the intentional action 
that he is looking for a coffee. Yeah? That is his intentional action. However, there is another view of looking at what an action is. And I'm going to explain to you what is the so-called classical tradition of action, intentional action. Interestingly, in the, the notion of intentional action is at the core of what is called practical reason in the classical tradition. And by the classical tradition, I include Aristotle and Plato, and also a medieval thinker, so-called Thomas Aquinas. So the view within the so-called classical view is that the intentional action runs parallel with practical reason, and that we are not composed of two elements, the element of beliefs, desires, on the one hand, and then on the other, the movements of our body, that, that we are constituted rather by a series of reasons that make intelligible the movements of our body. And this is going to be a little bit unintuitive, uh, difficult to understand, but as soon as I understand, you will understand, you will see how naive is the view. It's not a theoretical view, but it's very naive in the way is that how you make sense of the world. So the idea is that you always aim or desire an end, something that is presented to you as if were good, not necessarily objectively good, but it presented to you as worth to do it valuable, makes sense to do it, I should do it, all these things. So this end determines how you are going to achieve this end. So in a way, there are a series of means connected to the end. And this series of means are the reasons why you're going to pursue that end. So let us go back to the simple example. I will start with a simple example and we'll build up on that. So the simple example is that um, we knew Myodrak had just mentioned to me that he wants to have a, a cup of coffee, right? But underlying this so-called modern conception, they argue, there is something more in this structure. Oh, he thinks that he needs to have coffee because he thinks it will give him energy, yeah, for the day. So then this aim and that is presented to him, whom as good, it's good to have energy during the day, then explains or it makes intelligible, it's kind of a backwards view, why he's actually standing up, moving his legs towards the door, stepping up the stairs, taking up the kettle, warming up the kettle, pouring the hot water into the cup of coffee and making his coffee and drinking the coffee. So actually the end is the first thing that he understood. Oh, I need to make a cup of coffee now, so that will give me energy during the day. And then he understands that actually he has to stand up. He has to go upstairs, he has to go to the kitchen, has to warm the water, has to put the water into a coffee. So all these series of movements are reasons why he's doing what he, we are doing. So a famous philosopher of the 1950s wrote a beautiful book that is called Intention. Elizabeth Anscombe wrote a call, a call Intention. And that is a kind of a more modern approach to what I'm explaining. And she thinks that there is an heuristic or a methodology to understand the structure of intentional action parallel to practical reason is when we answer the question, why? So for each action of Neodrag, he was able to answer the question, why? So Neodrag, imaginary, imagine that I asked Neodrag, why did you stood up? Oh, you know, to reach the door. Why did you reach the door to get to the kitchen? Why did you get to the kitchen to boil some water? Why are you boiling some water to make coffee? Why? Don't you see? I need coffee. I need coffee to, so it will give me energy during the day. So she argues that underlying this structure that seems in the contemporary view too simple, too causalistic, there's a whole structure of meaning that is given by then towards, to, from the point of view of the agent. So one feature of this account is that this account is from the first person perspective or the deliberator. It doesn't mean it's subjective. Because at the end, Neodrag, to make a successful coffee, he has to rely on practices, right? So that's why practices become so important. Because any 
only thing we do is that we have learned it in a certain way. Even what is valuable, what is presented as good to the first person perspective. Of course, in a way, the distinction, the contemporary distinction between the so called third person point of view or objective point of view and subjective point of view or first person perspective vanishes when I'm talking about practices because it is how he's presented true from the first person perspective who knows that the coffee is actually something worth to do during the morning, but it has something to do with something that we do together. So let me go to a, to a much more complex project. Let us suppose that there is a transnational rule of law. Some people, I think Ferragioli is talking about the constitution of the earth, right? Yes. So let us suppose we are in a project of creating the constitution of the earth, right? That we need to solve all the problems, this so-called wild capitalism, um, extreme poverty, inequalities, climate, crisis, we have to create, Rajoli argues, principles to live, right? But we're not going to create them, the argument is, from top down, but from practices. And then from practices, from the point of view of us who think something has an end and is valuable and makes sense. So the research that says law and practical resources, when the judge creates something, the law, in the specific case, when the legislator are creating a statute, when we are creating the constitution of the earth, we are actually engaging in practical reason. So in a way, it's positive law embedded by practical reasoning. So we will say in a way, yes, there is a physical movement. New York went to get coffee. That's an object in the world. But he has produced these in a very specific way. Of course, with the help of the material world, but he has created something. And similarly, human institutions, we argue, are and this is the common ground of so-called practical reason, parallel to intentional action, is that we create things because they have meaning and end. And of course, all the complications about objective goods, how we are rich, the common good, how actually what is the role of the positive law, what happened with positive law that is perverse, and so on. All these problems are because at the core is this conception of action that is part immersed in so-called social practices. And I think that gives you a flavor of the kind of research that I do in so-called natural law lawyers do. But I don't like the word natural law because it might believe, you might think, oh, there is something above, you know, a metaphysical world or a God telling us what to do. No, it's something we have. It's a capacity to reason. So it's, it's the trust on the capacity to reason to build the best possible constitution of the earth, to, be, to build the best possible rule of law in a transnational order. So, for example, I have a paper saying that the, there are two views on the rule of law. So let me show you how this works in practice. Obviously, you can read Mio Drag's book, which is uh, uh, International Law in Action in Practical Reason. But also, let me give you another example. So the rule of law has two, there are two conceptions of the rule of law. One is the so-called thing conception of the rule of law. The other is the thick conception of the rule of law. In the former, we said that the law ought to be general, ought to be clear, cannot be retroactive, blah, 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 blah. So the so-called seven requirements um, advanced by um, Fuller in the morality of law, correctly. So the, the argument is that, that they seem like, you know, very minimal conditions for the good law, general law, clear law, non-retroactive law, and so on and so on. So these are the minimal conditions of law. However, some people have argued that there is a thick conception of the law, that you need to include conceptions of justice. And some people argue that that's what Fuller was trying to do from the so-called minimal duty towards an aspiration. And the aspiration is the point of justice and human rights, and if that's part of the rule of law. What about this proposal? It's just a proposal. I'm not sure about this. What about is actually, if it's all about values, so therefore, we need to decide on clear values within the practice. So clarity is not about clarity of propositions. It's not about clarity of the law, but the clarity of the values. What about generality? 
generality of values. And if that is the, another way of looking at this so-called thick conception with our notions of abstract notions of justice and human rights, probably we have a more manageable conception of the rule of law that can be, can, can be fulfilled at the transnational order. So this is just a, a view within practical reason, how practical reason can be used to contemporary views, including rule of law and transnational order. So I think we can open the, 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 the floor for debate and questions. I can see some people are like, nah, I don't like this. And some are just nodding. So yes, love to take questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't think I have Listen. clarity on this. It looks like I have a clarity on this, but I'm still doubtful. I'm still learning, believe me. I think Rav has something. Rav. He will. Does everyone feel free to step in? Feel free to comment, to questions. Just uh, use your mics because we are recording and for the people online too. Thanks for the can, can, can you hear me? Online people? Okay, good. So um, I'm wondering, uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm very sympathetic about something missing from especially the, the very minimal version of the delete the fire desire thing and particularly in explaining some aspects of how we engage with law but I wonder whether uh, I mean I think uh, other things aside I probably they, they can run in, run in parallel so we can like use like belief desire theory to explain some things uh, but other things can be explained except with reference to a more ethical conception of practical reasoning and agency. But I wonder whether, <clears throat> so I can, I can, if we think about how we engage with the laws as individual reasoners, the thicker aspect I think is, is quite easy to understand. I wonder when we get to the, to the, to the larger, especially the transnational, the global, I mean, and also just, um, heterogeneous individual nations and states, but in particular in the international sphere, where there is a lot of strategy and sort of involved in conflict um, and well conflicting interests, whether the whether the absence of a common good or at least the uh, the um, the low achievability of a, a common vision of good, which is what you are, uh, irrespective of there being a common good, there has to be a sort of a common sense or a sense of a common good. And uh, in those cases, it seems that maybe to me, I mean, I wonder whether uh, you might call it cynical, you might call it a realist, whether st stuff coming from the belief desire side, like decision theory, game theory that relies on, you know, beliefs about the likely, like, if I do this, what's going to happen, and how good or bad is it, and then you do all sorts of calculations, then that's how you pick your strategy, rather than try to see what looks as a worthwhile goal for us together, and um, hopefully some mix of that, you know, uh, is the right way to go, but I'm guessing lots of policymakers and negotiators and mediators are focused more on the, on just the nitty-gritty belief desire, like, if we do this, what's going to happen, how good or bad, like, they're not maybe like the stuff about the stuff about the, the what's worthwhile, uh, sort of to achieve as a common common good or something like that, or, or desirable state of affairs for all of us, um, maybe be running in parallel, but not be the, what's driving the decision process about what to do. So I, that's that's my very quick knee-jerk gut reaction to this, at least at that at that level. So it's not it's not that I'm not sympathetic to the thicker version, but I wonder whether in certain scenarios it's not maybe what practical, practical rationality should be about. This is rhetorical, right? I, I'm, I'm hoping it's the other other way, but I wonder what you think about the prospects of the thicker version in those contexts. Yeah, thank you very much. This is a very provocative and there's a lot there. So on the first question, um, so what, what, when, you ex when we explain the structure of practical reason, the argument is that is it, it is a naive view. So it's not, there's no intellectual point of view. It's not that you are deliberating what is, whether you ought to have coffee in the morning, right? So it's worthwhile doing it or not. Obviously, I, understand, I take your point that when you are doing a constitution, you're writing a constitution, it's a much more complex, you know? So there is disagreement, there's more disagreement or, for example, very pressing and difficult questions from the sanctity of life 
within, which includes abortion and euthanasia and so on. So I take up the point of moral disagreement. So let me first go to the point of the structure, right? So in my book, The Authority of Law, I argue that actually the theoretical account, the desire belief pair as causing our um, bodily movement as an explanation is theoretical in the sense that relies on the naive conception. So the naive conception, the structure of practical reason in terms of N is a primary. So we do it naturally. And then comes an explanation, oh, there is a desire belief that has this structure. And that theoretical explanation is successful only because the primary is successful. Now, you're, you're right. There is a strong, so the argument goes like this. There is moral disagreement. There is a deep moral disagreement. And that's the result of modernity, of our modern view of the world in politics, in justice, in morality. And therefore, um, it seems like, and that's the, the, the emergence of the game theory, right? And not, not, I mean, it comes from, after Hobbes, in a way, where Hobbes rely on an empirical conception of action. And then comes this view that, yes, I mean, the only thing we can do is a technical, practical reason. Yes, it's a technical. And this is what I'm trying to, to resist. I'm trying to resist that there is this technicality because we can foresee the risk of things without engaging with the value of things. So the argument is only engaging with the value, you need, you understand. So values are not clear. There's a process of deliberation in the classical tradition. I have recently worked quite a lot on that. It's settling the question of what shall I do? And it's settling the question in terms of the means towards an end. And these ends are constitutive of further ends and so on. But it's not like the final end, the grand end, the common good, has a, has a clarity. No, there is no clarity on that. It's indeterminate and operates like an oil boat. We have to repair the plants and engage in values and what is worth to preserve. So, so the technical reasoning, again, can come as a derivation once we understand the importance of the value. That's the point. So it, there is a space, you're right, for a risk assessment. But wholly because there has been a prior work on the engagement of values of the things. So that, that job, and th that's the claim of practical reason and the construction of the law. So that job cannot be overlooked and the other, the technical aspect. So there's the, the idea that decision-making theory can be pa very powerful and can be, I mean, game theory can be very powerful, but that's not how men and women engage in the world. And that the claim of practical reason and common good is precisely that we don't know the shape of the final end, but we want somehow a good society. It's called eudaimonia, but it's really called living well, that our children live well, that we live well, that our community live well. So then we go back to the problem of moral disagreement. I think it's an exaggeration, moral disagreement, because when you look at the particularity of the values, the political process, I mean, we were talking about yesterday about that, how the gays right there was a political process. We all had to understand what it entailed get gay rights. And that was quite important. The point is that within traditions of inquiry, within engagement, is that we understand the values of things. So uh, from the top down, you destroy the political process, basically. That's, that's, that's the claim, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, first of all, I'm so glad to, to have you here, Veronica, also the other members of the crew as well. Uh, my question, since you, you mentioned uh, just moving uh, at the transnational level, uh, I would like to know how the, 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 the conception that you are fostering uh, can be somehow potentially problematized if we are not dealing with uh, humans as or physical persons, but with the legal entities, uh, how the, the, the conception of intentionality is uh, further complicated uh, in the situation that you have uh, a basically a chain of uh, representation, meaning by the end of the day, it's always one person acting as a representative in the capacity of the representative of the state and how this uh, then 
interposed at the at the legal level of ascribing certain acts to uh, uh, legal entities and further on uh, ascribing responsibility for instance in 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 that respect that's the first question and the second thing it's also uh, it's noticeable for instance uh, uh, that in in theorizing international law there is uh, as you very well know there is a a strand of thought uh, coming especially from united states in in which uh, they are claiming basically that there is no international law that that everything can boil down to international relations and international relations can be explained as uh, uh, basically fostering uh, uh, what is in the best interest of the states so it's very often tied to rational choice theory but then again in a complex way to practical rationality so uh, the whole theory is basically uh, uh, constructed upon the idea that we can uh, dissolve law due to the uh, due to the very specific uh, formulation of uh, what is in the best interest of states so how can we account for for this seeming paradox at the uh, at the international uh, level particularly i mean if we if we take into account uh, uh, our current uh, news and everything what is going on around us i mean the the, the war in ukraine and if you try to translate into the uh, vocabulary that you were uh, that, that you were now uh, raising into asking why question and you can see quite a lot of uh, of the uh, attempts actually to explain in terms of exactly providing answers to the why question why for instance you you have enough uh, uh, of that attempts from the russian side why we are in the war why we are uh, and you always kind of have an an extra uh, value that is attached to to this uh, uh, to this explanation but obviously the explanations are uh, not sufficient as justification especially if we take them as, as legal as legal uh, reasons for action this is very difficult and, and that's part of the project isn't it so do you know the work of uh, Ekins on legislative intent in which he, I mean, th this is important questions, how collective intentionality will work, but you couldn't, you can't do it as a collective mind in a metaphysical sense. Can you do it as a common end? And if this is a common end that is objective, how the, all the parties, including a state and representatives, engage with that common end? And that is a very difficult question. And I've never seen actually a, co a collective theory, a group agency that is work well there is a work of um Paul Studer who wrote on Morgan the Nazi judge and she's do, she's doing it as she calls a constitutive kind of a Kantian view that we need to constitute by the goods and this good that uh, the Russian state is proposing supposed to constitute there as a state and the identity and that is a very doubtful that something get, that that is that test that cannot be passed so there are many ways of thinking, and this is a very profound and new ways of thinking about exactly practical reason in international law. And when I refer about the transnational order, I did a paper on the, um, on the uh, inter, uh, European international con uh, European contract law, in which I proposed I show the solution reached by a German court and a solution on undue influence in contract they are exactly the same. So how you know you, you, unity on conceptions of values are actually about the rule of law as well. So in both where obedience to the rule of law present cases and actually different interpretations, the German FFA uh, was on the, on the concept of dignity and this undue influence was on procedural justice. But then procedural justice and substantive justice can come together. This is a very important question and very difficult, but this is part of the agenda and hope we can work together on this. This is one of the questions I, I work a little bit with the um, power studer and it, it, it is a struggle to find but if we if we it could be a, something really important in policy construction yeah. Mm -hmm. How did we reach so quickly to the international law? 
favorite <laughs> favorite team for yeah. my for my folks. Okay. okay. <laughs> Any more questions or Sao is well? Just a follow up on this. Uh, if I understood correctly, the main goal is to achieve the generality or clarity of values. And I was wondering, uh, does it imply some sort of ob objectivity in that sense? Exactly. Uh, yeah. And could that perhaps be achieved through something like um, what Robert Alexi or Habermas um, proposed, the rational discourse, which could be procedurally objective, and meaning that we can find a consensus on the main points? Uh, is it something implied in, in that sense? Thank you so much. Yes, I try to resist the Kantian solution. Yeah. So yes. So so this is more about uh, in, in, embedded in the practice itself. So embedded in the culture of the respective countries and the and the way they engage with value. And have a forthcoming book and chapters four or to five dedicate itself to trying to to see how our particularity engagement with values has to do with a particular. And then these particulars can come together and we really realize actually we just aim at the same thing. And there's a paper of mind precisely that, how we inhabit this objective code. And it has to be bottom up, cannot be in the Kantian way, because that's, I mean, the critique of abstraction. And then actually practical rationality or, or any theory of practical rationality can do us a good job as a Habermas, yeah. I think it's too detached from actually end, because ends are, are, are here, constituted in here, in this place, which is the end of knowledge, the end of friendship, the end of community. And we experience it. It's not as something abstract. It's actually very concrete. Mm -hmm. Alexander. Ken. No, 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 Alexandra. Alexandra, 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 take the word. Paladino. Uh, ciao a tutti. Uh, well, um, hello, hello to everyone. Hello. Uh, hello to everyone. I am a PhD researcher. My thesis is about um, the concept of authority of Joseph, Joseph, Joseph Raz. And I have already um, um, found some uh, articles from uh, uh, you, Veronica, and I have read them. Um, it was very interesting for me, as uh, the subject of my thesis is um, Raz. So my question is uh, connected to my thesis, obviously, uh, because um, when uh, when you were saying uh, rule of law and two concepts of uh, rule of law, thin and thick uh, vision of it. Um, my question would be uh, one, uh, let's say, um, do you think that uh, RAS takes more into account the thick version of the rule of law? And um, can you give me some um, uh, explanations, uh, some more explanations um, about this, because I've read some uh, something already, but um, I'm interested in this, um, uh, in this question. And then uh, I would like to um, think about the generality of values of his um, liberal uh, perfectionism. I mean, um, when authorities uh, make decisions and uh, make uh, in a in a in a lawmaking process, um, can uh, his values be seen as um, good for a transnational law order as modern one? You know, because if we if we say that uh, the thick uh, concept of rule of law is more modern and more close to us. And if we if we also think about Raz as uh, an author that uh, actually says himself that he has in mind a modern civilized world, actually, when he um, 
talks about authorities and um, do you think that actually his values are are possible for a transnational law order for an account of transnational law order today? I mean, it, it does make sense. Does it make sense? Does 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 it make sense? Does, does a, a liberal perfectionism, um, his liberal perfectionism, makes sense to uh, those values of a, a thick version of rule of law in a transnational law order context? Thank you. Well, Alexandra, this is us. <laughs> so. It is. You, I think you 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 have put something interesting because, I mean, Ross explicitly said that he advocates a thin view, but then you're saying because of his political philosophy, and he's actually latest his conception his book, on the form of the good and so on, that you think that then is closer to the thick view, right? And that's a, an interesting reading. Um. Liberal perfectionism will be close. Excuse me. I, excuse me. I'm actually testing. Yeah, uh, I, I, I want to test if, if, if uh, he can be read in this um, idea because if uh, yeah. this, this is true, but um, I wanted to test the um, the reading of Raz, yeah. this uh, larger view that actually. Yeah. Um, in all his content, uh, I think there are some some interesting uh, things that can make you think that uh, a thin version is also possible. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, we need to think more carefully about it, and it's a very good question. Thank you, Alexandra. I just don't know what don't want to venture to to an answer. Probably Ken and, and my um, and Ambrose has better ideas, but I don't want to venture. Is it really difficult because you? You want to, and I think you're absolutely right on your intuition, to insert the question of the rule of law within the wider question of political philosophy. And you, I think you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have an idea, Ambrose? I have a lot of time on my hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good question, Alexander. I can see you're a very advanced PhD student. So. <laughs> I think Ken probably has some ideas, some thoughts on these. Well, I mean, classically, Raz is associated with a thinner view, as you say. Um, I think you have to be careful not to import a thicker view just because he says he wants to deal with modern conceptions of law. So he definitely wants to deal with modern conceptions of law, but the fact that some people might prefer a thicker understanding of the rule of law doesn't mean that that's, he's therefore adopting a thicker understanding of the rule of law. Now, I haven't read a lot of his recent work, but I have understood from other people who have that some of the last work that he did um, did suggest a bit of a thicker conception, not moving all the way to incorporating human rights necessarily, but understanding the rule of law as being one that um, seeks to produce, you know, some sort of uh, social good and things like that. So that would suggest a little bit more of a thicker concept towards the end, um, which I think could support some of what you're saying. Um, but classically, he's definitely associated with a thinner concept that, you know, talks about it more in the full in the sense like that fuller uses i mean it's hard to say fuller because fuller's use is of course very very thick in some ways but more of a procedural type of conception of rule of law where um as long as all of the you know the the procedures are in use correctly then we think that we're we're upholding the value of the rule of law and safeguarding the other values that we think we're trying to achieve such as human rights or other things like that for other ways of appreciating the law. I mean, you know, it's not like we should just put everything in the rule of law basket. That was his kind of classical argument. Yeah, thank you so much. I think that that's exactly the purpose why we are here. So you explore questions and then we have co conversations. This is so exciting. So thank you very much, Alexandra. <laughs> thank you, Ken. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, Professor Ehrenberg for your help. Uh, Boyan, you you want? To... Yeah, since it's the first time, very nice to see you in Belgrade again. Very nice to see Ken. Uh, and hopefully, he'll join us at one point uh, live. Definitely looking forward to it. Nice to meet Ambrose. So happy we already were talking yesterday. It's so glad to see the entire team of Surrey. My question is: um, 
So when we, uh, in terms of practical rationality, I always enjoyed reading your work, even if, I, if I'm not a natural law scholar, I was always like convinced that when you start from in, in a, an internal point of view in order to not to switch to an external point of view, you have to do s some moves that you do in your work. But uh, and it's a very interesting to hear that you have this project with sticker versions of rule of law. But my, my problem is with this collective intentionality part, and I know that it, it is an unsolved problem, but what seems to me or what I've uh, uh, been, you know, kind of convinced in, in the last years is that whenever you try to talk about collective intentionality, it would seem that you kind of, uh, from the perspective of acting, you collapse into a kind of procedural conception of, um, of achieving the goal, even if it's a valued goal, because on the individual level, we don't have to have these kinds of procedural moves. <laughs> Maybe if we are like these new new age <laughs> things like the 10 uh, rules for life or stuff like that. <laughs> but uh, on the level of the individual, you can go on achieving the, the good that you're set to achieve without having these uh, procedural requirements, but on a collective level, for example, when you take states into account, like you know, Dragon, you were mentioning, it would seem that any value that you postulate as a result of a consensus or as a result of a shared communication or as a result of dialogical, even if we have it, still in our acting, even if we have something like that steady, we would have to have like this kind of technical procedural um or or mean sense rationality in order to achieve any kind of goal like this otherwise uh, no collective action would be possible so that's basically my question what do you think about it? if if i sh could put it simply doesn't it then a thick conception of rule of law let's say collapse into a thin conception basically of rule of law because you would need this yeah, but what about precisely the, the failure, the contemporary failure is because of these technical procedures, right? So we, I'm not negating that there are different levels, but there, there has to be the level of engagement with the body or respective value by the community that is pretended to be ruled by the rule of law. So in a way, I mean, in, in this book I'm writing on negligence, I'm saying that the judges would pose a description of the respective values inviting the citizen to occupy a proleptic point of view. This means, oh, there's something, uh, my safety, uh, my physical integrity, I ought to use the seatbelt. There's something uh, of the safety of children, for example, that when the cross is three and so on. Isn't judges continuously, they look continuously engaging with the, with the way we value things in the form, a specific form. So we don't value life in abstract. We value my life as I live it in this particular, in my physical interview, in this particular context, X and Y. And of course, there could be policies which, which are technical, informed by science. For example, we know that if you drive at 20 kilometers per hour, most likely you will not kill the child in a, in a, in a so th that's precisely the particularity. So you're giving flesh into the, into that, in the technical scientific expert view in a way depends on what we value the life of the child so that's my question i don't see these are separate so the, the man or the woman who is engaged into this violence has to achieve it and see that they they, they has to incorporate scientific expert view but it's incorporated into the value somehow it's embedded into the value my only it's fantastic that you mentioned the, the safety thing because I was telling students about the safety thing and reasons for action and I use this example that is the example of uh, the, 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 the seed belts. So, uh, and my rendition of it was something like this. So we always knew that it's dangerous to drive without a seat belt. Nobody was carrying the seat belt. Nobody was fastening the seat belt. Then we got fines for the seat belt. Nobody was still finding the seat belt. Everybody is looking. Then we got cars that beeped when you don't fasten a seatbelt. 
we're like, oh, did this thing is beeping again, and we fasten the seatbelt. So it, it's kind of like, and the idea is that it becomes so so detached from the value that you. There pursuing. was a possibility of putting a seatbelt uh, underneath your. your but my father. Back and then it's not beeping. My father is still doing. <laughs> no, no, my father is still doing it. He buys these things and he puts them inside. Yeah, but he's like. So just these endless conversations with him, like you're going to kill yourself. I don't care. I'm 65. I don't drive anybody. And so, so it's just yeah. But but the the idea is that we are somehow in this case, for example, that you mentioned, we get so detached from the from a, the thing that we value that it would seem that we then collapse to Kraft's question that that, that started the conversation, basically. So now, why do we fasten the seat belts? Like in ninety percent of the cases, you will go get the question because I value for human life. It would seem that then we have kind of a disservice conception of authority of us, and then we go again into into something that's not, at least from the an internal point of view. If we're staying at the internal point of view, co connected directly with the value we're trying to protect. So there is an authority protecting this value and. Um, and we can be reasoned into it, but eventually we just do the technical thing so to so to stop the alarm from beeping when we don't pass an So it shouldn't be the law aspirational, isn't it? So of course this space space for irrationality. So your example precisely confirms what I'm saying. So you know that it's it's not right, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So but of course empirically we do it. Yeah. But the 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 the, the law penetrates and has penetrated much of our practical reason in the, in the last when you consider many things that the new generation do and say my, my my daughter say things that my generation wouldn't have said because of the law including law discrimination law um human rights things that you know my parents wouldn't say and i think the law transforms the citizen towards civic maturity mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's part of the challenge, absolutely. But of course, there's a space of irrational. And I come from Latin America. It's not that I have been in the UK, so I know exactly what you mean. We are irrational. <laughs> the Latin Americans are irrational. Yeah. Just the continue from the discussion. I used to work in public. Please, please introduce yourself. Uh, uh, sorry, my name is uh, Alexandra. Uh, and uh, what Professor uh, said reminded me of my previous work because uh, I encountered many people of my age who sadly uh, took drugs, even though we had, they had many discussions about why taking drugs is bad for your health, why is something you should avoid. They, the, only re the only time they listened is when they were fined. The only time they listened is when the public prosecutor uh, in tells them in the courtroom and in the public office, you got caught, there is a, your inscription, you said that it, uh, it is yours, you have to pay or the judge will sentence you to a uh, uh, couple of years on probation. Be no matter what he discussions he listened to, uh, his parents, his teachers, his the system, he didn't care. The only time he, he actually cared was because he had to uh, pay or do community service and something that actually law in trusts and the state um, managed to enforce. So it's a great question and it is a great idea of why we actually, why we actually, are we only, are we not moral and are, do we actually follow the law and values it for the law holds because of the sanction and because of uh, what dangers it might do to us, for example, paying, paying a fine or doing a community service. It's actually a very com topic that has not been discussed enough. Yes, you're right. I mean, I think this is a very difficult question theoretically, and there's so much to write about it, Alexander, question. It's a huge topic and very beautiful. By the way, I just did a speed awareness test. <laughs> of course, yeah, <laughs> because that's, that's something new. If you, so it was really, I felt very ashamed actually of myself after that. <laughs> so it works for some people, yes. Uh -huh. And I really look carefully now at the. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, it, 
It is a jam session. It's nice to have a, such a beautiful conversation, exchange of ideas, and uh, but we uh, need to stick to our schedule. And because of that, last question by Yelena, I'll be. Yeah, thanks. Student. Thanks. I will try to to be brief. Um, how? Uh, I'm not sure if the mic can reach. Uh, Jelena Danilovic, I'm also a PhD researcher in uh, legal theory and philosophy. Uh, since we are talking about the practical reasoning, I'm also a practical lawyer, so I'm working as a lawyer for 17 years now, 13 as a barrister, four now as the director for legal for compliance. So um, what I'm um, questioning is maybe more of a practical thing from my perspective, but it's also in connected with my thesis because for example, I'm dealing with the compliance business as a relatively new legal area in business. And um, actually, my thesis when I'm going into this area is a bit contrary to, to what the colleague said, which is that we are not only abiding by the rules because we are punished, but at least for certain rules, we are also abiding because there is a reason, there is a ratio why we are doing it. Um, what I do have as, as practical problem is something that the, the colleague also mentioned, which is actually how do we measure uh, adherence to the value? How can we assess whether the people are following the rules because they believe that it is an added value or not? So maybe my question, if, if um, when we are talking about the law, so now I'm talking really as a practical lawyer, so I'm not talking as a judge, because quite often legal theorists are speaking from the position as if what the judge would do. Uh, from my perspective, I'm a practical lawyer for 17 years. I think I'm very good at my job. I've never been on court because there is a law outside of the court and most of the law is outside of the court. So from my perspective, uh, just to ask you, when we are talking about the practical reasoning as the reason, what is worth, why are we doing some actions? Uh, who is the one who is deciding what is worth? Is it, for example, me who is writing the internal policies? Or is it a colleague who has to abide by these policies? And does it matter if his value are different than mine? So I'm writing and I think it's good for the company. He's abiding because he feels that he will be punished or he thinks that it's good for the company. Or does it matter at all what is our personal standpoint towards the value? Because now if you go to website of any bigger company, you will see that every company has its mission, its vision, its values, and everything that the company does is embedded in the values. Um, there is a lot of talk these days about greenwashing, about many people and many companies who are speaking about environmental uh, and giving all kinds of statements, but not actually practicing it. So in essence, uh, who is the one who should be addressing the value? Does it matter if someone else has different values, but by, by the law, does it actually interferes with the structure and the hypothesis that we are abiding by something because we believe in value if we cannot measure the adherence to the value? Yes, certainly I, I would be against the technical rationality of measuring it. But yeah, you're asking a very important question, which is walking the talk, right? So there are abstract, corporations have abstract mission, visions, and so on, how we walk the talk. Obviously, you have to create the draft of policies in a way that will engage, create a culture, the respective corporate culture, yeah. And um, yes, and I'm not a sociologist, so, but I think that there ought to be an empirical research on that. But the, the empirical research cannot be only technical, it has to actually invite uh, cultivate certain kinds of, yeah, walking the talk of the values of the corporation, yeah. And there's always going to be a gap, right? Because the construction of policies are aspirational. Um, yeah, so that's it, I, I don't think that, but, but that is a very practical question. And that, that, this can illuminate that, no question, on doing, you know, the, the more down to earth things. Um, there is a paper, actually, of a recent philosopher. If you write me an email, yeah, she's she's talking about the philosophical, how, how, what is walking the talk? Yeah, what is that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Veronica, for your very nice 
report and uh, thank you all for your discussions and let's continue with our second speaker ambrose floor is yours this one this one switch on yeah, this is yeah. let's not do two. Oh, oh. <laughs> and also the camera is this it's oh okay yeah. uh, yes can everyone hear me cool hello thank you very much then thank you very much for everyone organizing this and for inviting us over um so um so i i'm gonna basically talk a bit about some of the re some of the background behind um, some of the research I've been thinking about and it's, it's on one of the issues that, that Veronica already presented is on authority. So I'll just tell you a story about you know what I do and why it got me into it and then I don't know how much people know about the general literature on authorities. So I'll cover some of the backgrounds and the motivations behind it. But I'm moving on to some of the things I've been thinking about. They are very, very embryonic. Um, so any feedback that I can receive um, would be great. So my own research is on theories of punishment, justification of punishment, theories of criminalization. So basically, when under what conditions is it right, permissible for the state to criminalize a certain action, and as a result of criminalization, justifiable for the state to punish people who don't follow those kind of, um, um, uh, who violate those crimes, so to speak. So one of the things that, that is quite, I mean, there's a lot of debate about theories of punishment. I'm not going to bore you with that. If you want to know more, I'm more than happy to talk about it. But one of the consensus among most criminal law theorists is that, you know, if you want to justifiably criminalize something and punish something, then, then we need to be able to show that it was something that was wrong, that you ought not to do it, that you had, in some sense, an obligation not to do it, that it was wrong for you to do it, that you deserve censure to do it, uh, for doing it, and that is therefore, in some sense, justifiable to punish you for doing it. So taking that consensus as a starting point, then one question to ask is, under what conditions is when the law says, hey, do not do this, do not cross the road when it's green, do not drive about, when UK, 70 miles per hour, I don't know what the speed limit here is. Yes, is there one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. there is. There is, okay, yeah, yeah. that's not really followed. Well, oh, yeah. <laughs> Which is fine. Um, well, well, it might, the Lord tells you to do many. In the city, 130 on the, on the, uh, the, the motorway. Okay, yes. Kilometers. Kilometers, okay, well, that's 130 miles per hour. It's really fast. Um, so, um, yeah, so the Lord tells you to do many things, right? And it tells you that if you don't follow it, you know, you're going to get punished for it. You, you might have, if it's severe enough, you might have a criminal record, etc., etc. So the question is to ask, under what conditions, by saying something, the law, it makes it something wrong, that you have an obligation to do so. So that's basically the, the classical question about authority. Um, so what I'm interested in is probably motivated by this as a background. I'm interested in thinking about, and this is really something I'm starting to work on, it's about the nature of authority and under what conditions is legitimate. When there's, so to speak, an obligation to do what the authority tells you to do. So if you think about law as having authority, then the question is, when is it, just, when is it you know, true that there's an obligation to do what the law tells you to do because the law says so. So that's kind of the starting point of my research. Um, there have been two sides to this traditional issue, traditional analysis, traditional approach to this particular issue. Uh, one side can be called the conceptual side. And the conceptual side has been generally thinking, has the, the way in which they've been thinking about this issue is to focus on the duty to obey. So whether or not the law in virtue of it telling us to do something, whether it's by virtue of telling us to do it, we now therefore have a duty to do it. And correspondingly, a right uh, on the law's part to govern, to make it the case that we are obligated to obey. So that's kind of the conceptual side and traditional analysis of authority. There's also a normative side, and here's where, I don't know how many of you have a background in this, um, and this is where all the different theories of legitimate authority comes in. Um, so the standard module that we teach in UK when it comes to theories of, of legitimacy as well, there's consent theory, there's fair play theory, and then there's mass and surface conception. So consent theory basically says that, uh, why do you have an obligation to obey? Well, because you have consented to it in some way or another, and then they have flashed it out in many different ways about how you've done that. So that's one of the theories. And the other theory is the fair play theory. It basically says that, you know, the law exists to serve certain function, and in virtue of certain that certain function, we therefore ought to bear the burden um, to take on everyone's, you know, uh, doing this, obeying the law, and therefore coming to have this benefit. And so it is our fairness that we ought to do it. Um, so that's the fair play theory. Um, I notice a lot of people do RAS here, so I take it service conception is very familiar here. So, you know, RAS service conception basically says that, you know, in so far as doing what the law tells you to do, authority tells you to do, 
is something that that's conformed to the reason they originally have, then you have all things being equal, you have an obligation to do what the law tells you to do in those kind of, kind of cases. So one of the issue, if you look across broad on these theories, is that all these theories cannot really show that there is a comprehensive obligation to obey the law. Uh, it only at most shows that there is a piecemeal one. It's a piecemeal one that depends from one person to the next, depends whether you're consented to it, it depends whether the circumstances you're in are such that the normal justification thesis in RAS is satisfied. If you're fair play theorist, you might think that, well, just the, the fact that someone decide to obey the law, it doesn't make the case that I am acting unfairly if I don't obey the law. You can't foister the benefit onto me, as Simmons puts it. And so I need to have accepted the benefit in some way. And so all these theories, one of the problems, if you think, if you're not an anarchist, then one of the problems you might think here is that all the theory cannot show that there's a comprehensive obligation to obey the law within a certain territorial jurisdiction. There's always some gaps. Right? It's either because some people didn't consent, or accepted it, the benefit in question, or they don't satisfy the normal justification. So it varies from one person to the next, the obligation to obey. It also varies from one law to the next, depending on the circumstance in question. So that, that's kind of the traditional broad one five minute summary of, I don't know, what, 50 years worth of literature on, on, on theories of religious authority. So what I'm more interested in is that I think we can do slightly better. I think we can offer a less piecemeal version of legitimate authority. Um, that doesn't just boil down to just doing what the law tells you to do because the law says so. It's a bit more, there's some normativity in it. Um, and I think we can do that by really rethinking the conceptual side. So remember there were two traditional things uh, in the traditional analysis. It was the conceptual side about the duty to obey and the right to govern. And then the traditional theories to try to show there's a duty to obey. So I think we can offer, at least I try to think that we can offer, a more comprehensive view of legitimate authority, one that is less piecemeal in nature. By rethinking in some way the conceptual side of the story. So what do I mean by that? So as I said, the traditional side of the story is think of it as basically like there's duty on the part of citizens to obey. And if you think about the law or authority, the law's correlative right to govern or to impose this obligation. How many of you guys know Holfield? Legal jurist? Yes, yes, yes. So Holfield, I, I love Holfield because I think he's great. So if no one has read him before, I think one should read him. I always want to teach him in Surrey, but I never had the chance yet. Um, so so he's, he's a legal theorist. I think he's American. I'm not sure. Is he American? I think he's American. Yes, yeah, sorry. I, I'm not a very, I'm not a historic, historian of ideas. I just remember the name and use it, and I don't remember the, the gen genesis of it. So yeah, so Holmfield was a private law theorist, and then he had this really good paper that analyzed different kinds of judicial relationship. So one way you might think about, you know, uh, the relationship between duty and right is exactly the, the way I just described, and that's a kind of Holmfield way of thinking about it, is that for every duty that's directed to individuals, or directed to someone, then that person has a correlative right to it. Right? So that's where we, when we talk about human rights, claim rights, duty bearers, that's, that's the kind of framework we have in the eye. So that's the traditional way of thinking about authority, but, but why should we follow in that way? Right? Imagine when we think about the law, what it does is that not just, it, it does impose us duty, but in some sense, that's the outcome of something. Right? It has a certain normative power. It has this power to change our views by saying, hey, you ought not to do this. Hey, you need to stop the red light. Hey, you need to not drive below the high, above 130 kilometers per hour. You should not do this. You should not do that. Then by saying it, it changes your normative situation. So if we understand it in this terms, right, then we shouldn't think of the fundamental conceptual way of thinking about it. We shouldn't be thinking of it in terms of duty to obey and the corrective right to root. Talk that to one side. We should think in terms of the normative power to alter people's position, normative position, and also people's liability to having their normative positions modified. So I think that's a different way of thinking about it. So rather than thinking about duty and right, we pluck that to one side. We focus more on what Holfield calls the second order of normative powers. So the normative power to change the first order normative duties and rights, and also people's liability to be subject to that normative power. And so once we, we have that conceptual apparatus in place, then I think we can kind of think about justifying authority, legitimate authority, 
as an instance of justifying the existence of this normative power. We can ask when and under what conditions it is justifiable for an entity like the law, like the state, or whatever authority you might be interested in, and ask why is it justifiable for this entity to have this normative power and for people to have this liability in question. And so that's the kind of approach I was thinking. Because if you can justify broadly the existence of this power, right, then you don't have the gaps anymore. Every ex if assuming the exercise of them are also justifiable, then supposedly there will be there won't be any gaps within the certain jurisdiction, so to speak. So that's that's kind of the broad picture um, of of what I have. So I, I mean I haven't really worked on it um, as something that I've been in in back burner for a while. My own research has been on, on punishment and luck, and then something I need to get done first. And so this has been just boiling at the back. Um, I have some thoughts on this, so I can say a bit more about it. But that's the general broad framework about the approach that I think would, would, would make a better account um, for trying to show why there's an obligation to, to do what the law tells you to do. So a couple of additional things, and I think we can then open it up for, for discussion. I think the key here when it comes to justifying this normative power and this correlative um, liability is really to focus on it, to enumerate in some sense what are the kind of things that can justify it. Because you don't want anything to justify it. Uh, you need some very specific account about what can justify the existence of this power. Because if you're too loose on that, then you basically justify the obligation to obey in basically any kind of legal system. And you don't want that. Uh, you want to at least say that in some legal systems, there isn't any obligation to wait a certain kind of circumstances. So you need some account for it. And I think one easy way of thinking about it is that maybe one of the things that can justify this normative power is in terms of instrumental, certain kind of ends that can be uniquely achieved um, by putting people into a kind of accountability relationship. So by, you know, somehow, for example, it might be a better way of resolving certain coordination problems. It might be better for preventing harm or something like that by giving an entity this power that can make you obligated to do certain things. So that's an instrumental way of thinking about it. And I think that might be one way in which you might think it's justifiable. I'm personally more interested in the more intrinsic way of doing it. I think besides instrumental ways of justifying the existence of the normative power, I think there are some more intrinsic values that can be served. So you might think that within a certain political community, this is totally just out of the top of my head, I haven't really thought through this, but the general idea here might be that if you may think within a certain political community, there's a value in an entity being able to put us in a mutual accountability relationship, in this ability to put each other and impose on each other obligations and then hold each other accountable for it in some way. Um, so that's kind of mirroring a bit of a political theory into the justification authority. And I think that gives you a rather intrinsic, kind of intrinsically va intrinsic value that can be served by, by justifying authority in those kind of cases. Um, so that's the general thought that I have. Um, I mean, another thought I generally have right now is I envision this to be kind of like a two-stage thing. So as I said, there's first the justifying who, what, which institution has this normative power and therefore the corresponding liability for those who are subject to that power. Um, but I also think that besides an entity having it, we also need to ask individual exercises of this normative power whether it's justifiable. Does it actually achieve the end it does? Does it achieve in the end that it's proportionate in the way, et cetera, et cetera? So I think that kind of like a two-way analysis, this account implies a two-level analysis when it comes to um, authority and legitimate authority. First, we ask at the general level, does this entity, the right kind of entity, to have the normative and power in question? Are these the right kind of people to be liable to that entity having that normative power over them? Once we answer that question, then we ask individual exercises, individual laws, for example, if you're interested in legal authority, in individual laws when passed, are they subject to certain kind of constraints that make it justifiable, the specific exercise of the power? So those are some of the general thoughts I have in advance in this. And uh, as I said, it's, it's something that I'm still thinking. I haven't written anything on this yet. Um, so any thoughts, anything? Um, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ambrose. I was always convinced that I must uh, learn something about Hart, Raz, Orkin, 
uh, to be able to speak in with Anglo-Saxon academics, but unfortunately, it's not enough. I must learn Hochfeld conceptual framework, which is not so simple. It's not widely used even in Anglo. <laughs> Veronica. Yes, thank you so much. There was someone else on there. Ken, was, 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 well, Ken was yeah, Ken. The book came because no, no, but Ken also, yeah. <laughs> Veronica can go first. We we all can talk to each other anytime we want. It. <laughs> you, yeah. yeah, very quickly. Um, uh, as you know, Finn, is, um, Finn has a theory, a comprehensive theory of what we ought to obey the law. He thinks there's a general duty to obey the law because you cannot take an advantage on the contract law, for example. Um, and then don't obey the traffic law, the law traffic. Oh, yeah, the seamless web argument. Exactly. Yeah, I never quite fully really get the... Yeah. So, I mean, I think the crux with, with Finnis' argument is that the... It's not at all clear the seamless web thing carries an omnibus heavy lifting that it can carry, right? So, you know, the, so you need a substantive account of why there's an obligation to obey the law. You can't just say that, well, if you obey one part, then given the seamless web of the law, you cannot disobey the other part. It needs to, it needs a bit more, it can't do that normative heavy lifting that you might want it to do. You don't do it to the good, right? It's the basic goods. You cannot participate in some basic goods and not the others. Yeah. Yeah, you need to have basic goods, I think. But maybe you're right. I mean, when you introduce the normative power. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I think the, tra um, yeah, in some sense, I mean, the tradition I'm trying to respond to to is slightly different from, yeah, so I mean, Finnish tradition would be something like, you know, what we as a society or a legislator ought to be doing to try to make laws that serve the common good. And given the fact that it serves the common good, it's grounded in reasoning of individuals and all the other stuff. And what he does is then, in some sense, trying to, in light of the common good, trying to come up with the right kind of laws, and because those are grounded in basic goods, they are something of which we already have an obligation to obey. I think, yeah, I need to think more about how this tradition that I've been trying to respond to intersects into that tradition. I think partly it's the, the, com the point in which the point of departure, the starting point is slightly different there. Yes. Um, and especially because there's an intrinsic substantive. Yes, but it's slightly different from the basic goods. So I'm, I'm, my account, and so far the intrinsic one, I mean, so far I want to defend the intrinsic value of mutual accountability. It doesn't have, it, it can be just the mutual relationship itself is valuable. It doesn't have to be that, that itself serves some further basic goods, so to speak. It can, that's why I'm happy to do that too, but I don't think it has to. Professor Ehrenberg. Um, Yeah, so again, we can talk about this anytime, and I'm hoping we'll have a chance to talk a lot about it since we're both working on similar stuff here. But um, I just wanted to push you a little bit to explain a little bit more about why you thought the fact that Raz's view was piecemeal was problematic. And on top of that, given that that's your motivation for trying to improve on it, why do you think that um, talking about the whole Feldian analysis in terms of, let's say, people's liability to have their normative status changed or their normative situation changed makes your view less piecemeal. If anything, you might think that the factors that go into people's liability to have their normative situation changed could be even more diverse than what you would find with Raz's theory of authority. And so therefore you'd end up with an even more piecemeal account than Raz gives. If, if I can yeah. jump in, because my question is similar to Ken's. Uh, I was like, it was about this piecemeal character of, of, uh, of um, theories. I always thought it to be a feature and not a bug. Uh, this, this is, the, the, and the idea is this, so if I have this piecemeal conception of authority in the sense that I can um, ask myself all the time, is this utterance from this authority, am I justified in following this utterance from this authority? It kind of like feels right from the perspective of my practical rationality, even if I have reasons every time to act according to the, to the instructions of the authority, it kind of 
it follows this idea at the time that authority is um, squareable with practical rationality, that it doesn't preclude practical rationality. If you give me kind of this account that um, th this integral account, how is it justified to have a power of, over another person's normative position? It seems to me that it seems to me that there is not much in ways of my practical deliberation in the sense I wouldn't be able, uh, or at least ki kind of it seems to me difficult to say that like um, I would be under the, the obligation, or it would be justified for the state of Serbia to issue anything in this case. So I always thought of these things like uh, in the sense that if it is piecemeal, then my my autonomy is preserved. If it's not piecemeal, then my autonomy is uh, is somehow negated completely. And that that is, I think, also Razi's intention when he formulates his theory of authority, because he formulates uh, he formulates it basically against Robert Paul Wolf's anarchy uh, mm -hmm. conception of uh, of of um, yeah, I'm stuck. Of <laughs> yeah, anarchism. Uh, yeah, so that was my question. I think it relates well to Ken's question, so that's that's why I jumped in. So, so first is that I I don't so I'm not claiming that rest so the piecemeal thing as as a bug. Uh, I was claiming it more like from my point of view, I I see that as a bug for certain things. Um, so you know if if the, so the background that I have is that I work in criminal law theory, um, and one of the Big things in criminal law theory is about the justification of what is now referred to as malleable prohibited crimes. So crimes that are not, in some sense, malleable in say they are not, in some sense, like inherently immoral. One might put it that way. So think about regulatory crimes. Uh, so many of these are administrative, uh, usually crimes of administration. Uh, in UK, they are some of them are, are part of the criminal law and can be subject to criminal sanctions and criminal censure. So those are regulatory crimes. Or think about, even for Malin, say there are certain kinds that aren't, so think, think about, if I may, statutory rape law, so for example, certain set limits on, on, on age, uh, that regardless, as long as the person is below certain age, they can consent for certain kind of activities, regardless of whether that person is old enough, it is actually sufficiently mature enough for it or not. Right, so those kind of crimes are the kind of crimes that I'm really, sometimes, puzzles me as a criminal law theorist, why is it just about punish people for it? Um, and so part of it turns on trying to show that, you know, in enacting these crimes in justifiable circumstances, it somehow in some sense makes it wrong, uh, and therefore makes it justifiable to be something that's criminalized and therefore something to be punished. So I'm not claiming that, in the abstract, that RAS, you know, RAS's theory that implies these new obligations to obey the law is a bad thing. I think it's a great thing. Um, but at least in, in the context of the kind of problem that I'm interested in, it doesn't give me a satisfactory answer yet. That prompted me to look for another one. So that hopefully answers some of the some of your, your point and Ken's point about, about rest, the buck thing. Um, in terms of the... Sorry, there was a lot there. So I'll just ask... Sorry? Yeah, so there's autonomy. So I, I need to think more about that. So I have a perfectionist view about autonomy, just like rest. And so I, I think one, I think the issue here is not really autonomy, it's really the fact that if we think about justification from this third objective point of view, which I seem to be alluding to, and that this mismatch between ethical reasoning as I understand me trying to figure out what I ought to do, versus what is justifiable for the state to do so. And, and this kind of mismatch is what, what, what was it causing the problem there. And I just need to, so I just need to think more about I tend to think something that is justifiable are uh, in principle things of which that I have reasons to do. Not necessarily obligation, but uh, things of which I can see the justification or something along those lines. So some people might disagree with that. So there are different accounts of, of internalists versus externalists and in the other stuff. So I think that's one thing that I need to think more about how to match the understanding of justification and matches onto the practical reasoning point of view. And that might help solve some of the problem. Because if, if from the practical reason point of view, there are reasons to follow these rules in question in light of it being justifiable, then I think the autonomy issue disappears if you're professionalist about autonomy.
because then you have reasons to do the thing in question. If you have reasons to do the question, then it's not against the autonomy to do it for the reasons that you have. Yeah. Right? Yeah, maybe something along the lines of yeah. the line. Yeah. Under the guise of good. <laughs> yeah, some, something like that. So it could be that Strauss is only discovered in the literature. I think if, if you follow the, this line of reasoning, yeah. you would have to be convinced, it would seem to me, that, that, the, the, that the authority is acting in order to promote the good of an individual, for example, yourself, or something like that. Do, do you think so? I don't think. Not that sense of good, no. Okay. Yeah, not not that sense. I don't I don't yeah. think it has to be justifiable in the sense that it is good as I see it, uh -huh. however that amounts to. Um, I do think that things are justifiable to the extent that I have that had I been in a better epistemic position, I might know about it. I think that's uh -huh. yeah. I don't know whether Veronica will agree with that. Yeah, I don't think she will agree with that. <laughs> so I I am internalist in some sense, but but not. I'm not purely externalist when it comes to practical reasoning. I think I have some conditions about internal, but not full fledged internalism in the way that Veronica goes for. Um, we'll have the chance, probably. Yeah, we should talk more about yes. that. Um, sorry, I, 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 I think I haven't answered your question yet, Ken, have I? <laughs> I mean, you, 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 you said you don't think it's, you don't think, you're saying you don't think it's a conceptual bug, but you still think it's a, in a way, you know, you're still saying it's a bug because it's not explaining your, um, you know, it, the the piecemeal account can't really explain what you think you're seeing with with Mala and say with Mala prohibited crimes, and it may, leaves some kind of tension there. So it's still a bug with respect to Mala prohibita, and therefore it needs to be resolved. And you think the way to resolve it is to decrease, turn down the level of um, of uh, of piecemeal, but again, I'm not sure that your solution. I, I guess the other part of the question was, how does yeah. your solution actually dial down the piecemealness? Yeah. So, oh, sorry. Should, should I answer that, or should yeah, I? Yeah. Yeah. Last question, please, yeah. for this. Uh, so, yes, Rieta. Well, thank you very much for. So sorry. Thank you very much for all your all your ideas. So, I had I wanted to jump in in these. Uh, last question that Ken asked, in the sense of, I think that every account of authority could be constructed as trying to find some norm of competence that an authority has. Then, when you talk about competence of normative power in the sense of Hoffman, for example, and so depending when, the, I think that it all depends on what do you think a right comes from. If you think that, for example, the right to command from an authority comes from some type of power conferring norm, I think that you can construct or reconstruct Ra's account of authority in those terms. Okay. Yeah, but in this sense, I think that I will um, have the same question as Ken. Like, how is your account dif uh, different from others' accounts? If it's basically, so if you're basically saying we have to try to understand it in terms of power, of normative power, but I think that everything, every discourse of authority can be reconstructed as such. So I don't see, I think that Ken is also asking mm. that, I don't see how your um, position would be different or how your position would decrease this piecemeal thing. That's a, I agree with you that Ross is piecemeal and this is a this is a problem. But I don't yeah, I don't think I agree with you. People can yeah, no, no. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't know. No, I have to premise, I agree with you in this, but I don't think that approaching it from the ang the angle of having a power conferring question would decrease it. Because it's the same. Okay. I, I can go further, but yeah. Yeah, so I think part of it is because I'm missing the substantive part about what exactly is the justification. So the thought that I have, and I'm not saying that this necessarily answers the question. Sorry, I'm speaking while I'm thinking. That's what I said at the back. Um, so I'm not saying that this necessarily answers it. But I think, so think about the intrinsic one, the intrinsic justification I was aiming for. So the thought there is that there's something valuable within the political community that we put ourselves in a mutual accountability relation. 
So assuming that story works, I'm not saying it does, but let's assume that one candidate story. Obviously, it won't work just by me saying one sentence about it. But let's assume that that's working. Then I think that gives you at least a candidate theory that can cover everyone within the jurisdiction, right? Because the thought there is that you know the political community, i.e., this group of individuals who are part of the political community, there's something valuable that they put each other in a in a mutual accountability relation. So that's the kind of thought that I was having. I think in terms of instrumental reasoning, so for example that. By putting people in this kind of relationship, it serves some of the goals like harm prevention or coordination and stuff. There might be some gaps, and then you need some other things to fill it back in to get get the less piecemeal stuff. But the intrinsic one, if it works, and that that seems possible. So my response is, I think you're right. I think just by and I do not pretend to think that just by focusing on non-fit power versus liability, that would just by itself just this conceptual move. Will imply the normative implication that we can cover everyone. That that wouldn't make any sense, right? But the thought is that by first moving to the concept, change the conceptual stuff, and then we ask what we can justify it, and I think it opens the way for the possibility of one that can offer a justification that covers at least the jurisdiction in question. That's the idea I have in mind. Not saying I have offered the full argument for it. I'm just saying this is have literally focusing on that. Sorry, second. Accountability is prior to Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can kind of think of. Yeah, I can kind of think in there. I can, I can agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, to try to establish a way of relationship between capital authority and the person and the individual, three way relations between authority and individual. Mm. So, in this On the basis of this idea, I think that we try to do something. Okay. Yeah. No. I think I, obviously I need to look at this one. Ambrose, can you repeat the question, Ambrose? Because I couldn't. Oh. Mike didn't pick up that question. Yeah. So the question was, I think it was a very good one as well. Um, that perhaps now that if 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 I'm going to rely a bit more on this idea of mutual accountability and stuff, then maybe Finnis. What I'm saying is very similar to what Finnis is trying to say. Because what Finnis is trying to say is that there's this, he tries to show authority by looking at individual as citizens, community, and authority, the law, and and having this triangular relationship that's doing quite quite a lot of work there. Um, and I think that, yeah, so that's something that I need to think more about. I think. Um, there, we have from If, if I had this remote control, I could show it to you, <laughs> but I don't. Yeah. Or I mean, but I think this is just a taste of all the things we can do together, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Let's see. It's like a Hollywood movie. <laughs> it's fantastic. Okay. Uh, let's finish this soon. Thank you, Ambrose. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, Professor Ehrenberg, floor is yours. Our last speaker for today. Great. Thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, or, well, I'm at home, so I'm, of course it's a pleasure to be Oh, but <laughs> I wish I was there with you, actually. Uh, I, I was hoping to be able to make it. I just couldn't make everything work with the visas and everything because we just got our visa situation sorted out. Actually, since you have the remote, if it's not too hard, could you point the camera back at the audience while I'm speaking just so I can see if any of them are falling asleep or anything like that? Um, just uh, and then I'll, I'll I can use my um, my my old torts professor's uh, 
uh, trick is I, I shout louder when people start to fall asleep. So, you know, that way I'll make sure that they're uh, not falling asleep. So anyway, I, I'm also very interested in authority. Um, but some of my work before was about the relationship between the kind of thing that law is, what its nature is, and how it gives people reasons for action. And so the relationship between those two things as a way of trying to solve some age old problems about where laws reason givingness comes from. Um, that obviously is very closely related to authority because it only really successfully gives reasons for action when it's authoritative. And so all the questions about when is it authoritative becomes becomes important as well. Um, but I was hoping maybe I would start just by um, giving you an idea of some of just giving you a flavor of some of my ideas about how it solves some of those problems. How where does law get this reason givingness from and how does it get going with that? Because um, that's the only way it can really have an impact on our practical reason is that, you know, you could say it's just because law is threatening us. The only reason that we we have to follow what the law says is because we have threats or because people are going to look down their noses at us or something like that. The problem with those kinds of answers, as you might know, is that, well, if you could break the law and get away with it and no one would ever know it then why would you follow the law in that case? If the only reason was you're afraid of punishment, then you're not really giving any reasons that come from the law, you're getting reasons from the threat of punishment. And in many cases, the, the punishment is separate from what the law is telling you to do. The law tells you to do this, and then it says, and if you don't do it, then we will you know, do this bad thing to you. And in some cases, it doesn't give you a punishment. I mean, there's an example in the United States uh, we have something called flag law, which is about how to treat the United States flag. Um, and there's no punishments associated with that whatsoever. Uh, if you don't follow it, nothing happens to you. Uh, it's protected speech. And yet there's still instructions in the law about how to treat the flag. So the problem comes from this age old problem, which we attribute to, to David Hume, although I think it goes back earlier. It's sometimes called Hume's guillotine. This is the problem of how do we get from merely descriptive statements about what is the fact, what is the case, what are the facts, to what we ought to do about it. Hume said, there's no way to do this. The only thing you can do is if you have, it's not that, you know, oughts can't be true or false, that when you say you ought to pay your taxes or something like that, maybe that's still capable of being true or false. It's just that you can't get an argument from the parliament passed a law or the people in parliament did something and then, you know, they said, I, they said, yes. Uh, and then it was, you know, it was adopted or whatever. And it says you have to pay taxes by April 15th or whenever you have to pay your taxes. Um, or if they pass a law that says they're going to open up the mines of the country to the Chinese com country co companies like they did last year in Serbia, you know, that therefore the officials should then throw open the mines to, 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 the, to, the, to the Chinese companies or something like that. So whatever the law says, that's just, at least by legal positivists, that's just a, understood to be a species of social fact. It's just a fact that happened in history, right? Somebody said something in Parliament, so maybe they wrote it down, there was some sort of vote, right? And the vote, you know, there were more people voting yes than no, and that's all there is to it, right? So it's just a fact that happened in history. How do you get from that fact to the question about what you ought to do? Why ought you to pay your taxes? if the only fact that was there is that some people said you should do it, right? So it seems like there's a bit of a jump there. That's the is ought problem or Hume's guillotine. And it presents us particularly problematic. It's a particularly difficult problem for legal positivists who say that law is just a social fact. Now, um, anti-positivists like natural law, they may have easier ways out of it because they understand normativity like real normativity about what people ought to do is really imbued and embedded within the nature of law itself. But if you think that that's, you know, that, that you think that law is basically a tool that's created like by human beings, which is something I, I believe, how do you want to reconcile this idea that law is a tool with the idea that it gives you reasons for action? I mean, let's think of some other tools. Another tool would be the chair you're sitting on, right? So the chair doesn't, the existence of the chair doesn't give you a reason to sit. You only have a reason to sit if you feel tired and you want to sit down. And the chair gives you a way to sit down, but it doesn't give you a reason to sit down. The mere presence of the chair doesn't give you a reason to sit down. So I want to say that it's a tool, but I have to figure out how does the fact that it's a tool mean that it can still give me 
a reason for action. Tools don't give us reasons for action, right? Unless you already have a reason to go along with it, or already have a reason to adopt it or use it in some way. So my theory is that the law, I'll tell you what the theory is and I'll tell you how it tries to answer this Humean problem a little bit. I'm not sure it's a great example. It's not, everything's not completely all ironed out and figured out, but I think it's pointing to in some ways. So my theory is that the law is an institutionalized, abstract artifact. So to say that it's an artifact is just to say that it's like a tool. It's a tool that communicates its function, right? So, you know, what that, what that means is that it's, it's just like any other tool, like a chair. You know what it is because you look at it and it somehow communicates what it's for. By understanding what it's for, you understand how to use it. And you also understand that the people that are making it are, in a sense, communicating to you. They're communicating something about at least see it as the kind of thing that it's supposed to be, right? So when you walk into a room and you see a chair, you understand that the person who made the chair was making something for you to sit on if you wanted to sit on it, right? So there's a communication between the person who made the chair and you. This is something I'm making for you know you to use if you need to. And this is the way I think you're probably gonna see how to use it. The shape of the chair communicates the kind of thing it is. So you understand what it is by looking at it. You could say the same thing a little bit about law, right? That when the creator of the law made the law, of course they want you to use it as a law, which means they want you to follow it and they want you to recognize it as a valid law. So the fact that it's something created by another human being, we can understand that to be a sort of like a request. So if your friend says, hey, would you like to meet me for coffee after the lecture or whatever, right? You're gonna say, you know, I, 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 let's say your friend says, I'd like to meet you for coffee after the lecture. I have something really important to tell you, right? Or maybe it's not even that, you know, just an acquaintance. There's a request going on. You get your reason to behave as the friend requests you to from the fact that the friend is desiring you to do that, right? You get the communication of the friend's desire to meet up with you and that becomes your reason. So whatever is made in that communication, something about that communication and the fact that you understand the desire behind it gives you a reason to satisfy that friend's desire, right? So there's something Something similar is going on with the law that the that the legislature is so or the legislators are communicating their desire that you act in a certain way, and that may give you some sorts of reasons already. But you know, it may just be that you recognize that they're asking, right? So sometimes you get a request, and you you know, you're like, I, I don't have any special relationship with this person. Why should I meet this person for coffee? I don't know who this is. Some stranger walks up on the street. Now, you probably have some reason to meet them for coffee if they ask you, but at the same time, you might be like, well, wait a minute, I don't, I don't have a very good reason to meet you for coffee if, if I don't know who you are. So at the very least, what we're seeing here is when they make, if, if they're making a tool, like uh, the artifact is this tool that communicates its function, then we would say that they're, they're at least asking you, please see what we're doing as a, a member of the kind of thing it is that is creating a kind of law. And so there's a separate question about whether you still have a, a, enough of a reason to go along with it. When I say that it's an institutionalized abstract artifact, to say it's abstract just means it's not material. I don't think laws have to be written down. They could all be in someone's, in someone's head, right? I mean, they probably have to have be communicated to count as a law, but we could be, we can imagine that all the laws in, of a certain year, all the laws were erased or the book was lost or the book was destroyed doesn't mean the law ceases to exist. So that's why it's abstract. To say that it's institutionalized, an institution is a framework, a social framework for creating statuses and assigning statuses. And these statuses are to try to accomplish goals by creating these artificial normative system. So let me explain what that means a little bit. And then it'll look, it, it's a little kind of discombobulated, but you'll see how it all ties together with the problem that Hume gave us, right? So an institution is a, a system that's created by people acting in concert with their kind of shared intentionality to create an artificial way of changing people's rights and responsibilities towards each other. 
So let's think about a university, right? A university is an institution. People have roles in this university. There's the role of the lecturer and the professor. There's the role of the student. There's the role of the administrator, right? And these roles have rights and responsibilities that are attached to them by the rules, if you will, that set up the institution. I'm not talking about legal rules. The very idea of the university implies that these roles carry special rights and responsibilities within the institution that go beyond just the general rights and responsibilities we have as members of society. If you ran into the administrator or your professor in the street outside of the university, you might feel some compunction about trying to talk to them in a certain way because you still think of them in your terms of your relationship like you are in the university. But the truth is that, you know, you could just say hello or you could just ignore them. It doesn't matter. You're not violating anything in the university. But when you're inside the university, if the administrator came on the intercom and said everybody has to leave the building, well, you have a reason to leave the building because, you know, whatever their background reason for ordering you out of the building is, they're an official of the university and now they have this kind of expected status that gives them you know, a little bit more authority to tell you what to do within the confines of the university. Again, this is not even talking about law yet. I mean, of course, the university is set up within the context of law and stuff like that. I'm almost done. Just maybe a couple more minutes here. Um, so what the institutions do is they try to accomplish some sort of goal. Maybe with the university, the goal is to educate students and to develop human knowledge and research. And they do it by creating these statuses, student, professor, administrator, these statuses that they attach to people and maybe objects or other things, right? And these statuses carry normative weight within the institution. So while you're there, the status of the administrator carries this extra weight that you're supposed to do what they say, as long as you're abiding by the internal rules of the institution, the internal understanding of the institution, right? So, so far, nothing I've said goes against Hume, right? Because the, the, the idea that Hume is that's telling us that we have to, you know, we have to have an ought in the premises of our argument before we can get an, 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 an ought in the conclusion is still there. And I'm saying what's going on is there's nothing automatic about any of this that says we have a reason to do, let's say, what the administrator says. It's not that we actually have that reason. It's just that the institution is telling us that we have a reason. So it's like Hart saying, for example, you know, when you legally ought to drive under, you know, 120 kilometers per hour, that's not an actual ought in a certain way, because it's just a fact. It's just a reference to back to the fact that the parliament passed to, uh, something happened in history. The people in parliament said yes when they were asked, do you want to make it the speed limit or whatever? Right. So that's still just a fact to get from that descriptive fact to the idea that I ought to drive under 120 uh, kilometers an hour, I need to actually have a reason to embrace the institution. In other words, to, to see myself in its context, to go along with the rules of that institution, to believe in the statuses that it's, it's putting on people and events and objects so that they then ha carry that normative power over me. Right. So the thing that makes it the kind of that makes law the kind of thing that can potentially give us normative requirements is the fact that it's an artifact, because there's the communication that 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 sort of suggests a request right from one person to another. And the thing that then makes it well, why should we go along with what the whole thing is? Why should we obey the law, as it were? That's a question of whatever legitimates the law, whatever legitimates its authority. If we have a background legitimization for the legal system or from for that particular rule, then we can jump from legally I ought to go under 120 kilometers an hour to I ought to go under 120 kilometers an hour. OK, I think that was about 15 minutes. Is that OK? It's OK, thank you. Yeah. Uh, please comments, questions about the report of Professor Ehrenberg. Veronica. Yes, thank you so much for this explanation. So um, at the end you say whether there is um, the question of legitimacy is different from this explanation in, in terms of the status, which is very rich, right? 
So this is a separation. Um, and I wonder, I mean, you said we, we can jump from what is legally I ought to do to what I ought to do. But I wonder whether there is uh, here, what, what kind of ought is this legally ought? Um, it is about it, it, whether you have managed to break the human, um, you know, dichotomy of the ease of the ought. Because when, when, when Hume talks about the dichotomy, this ought is a robust uh, ought. It's not the social ought, right? Yeah, I, I'm not, yeah, just to clarify, I, mm -hmm. I'm not disagreeing with Hume. So I'm not, I don't follow Searle and think that we can get from an is to an ought. I don't think we can. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not beating Hume. I'm showing how we can explain legal normativity within a, a, a res, the restrictive framework, if you will, of mm -hmm. Hume's guillotine on the one hand and believing that law is a social fact on the other. So the problem is, Hume seem, if we say Hume's right, you can't get to it from an is to an ought without having an ought in the premises. And if we were, are wanted to be legal positivists, which not all of us want to be, but if we want to be legal positivists and say that it's law is just a matter of social fact, then there doesn't seem to be any way to explain the normativity of law. And so I'm saying I can still think I can do that by explaining the legal normativity as this contextualized, institutionalized thing, and then saying there has to be some other argument, and this is why it still respects Hume, some other argument for why we should embrace and see ourselves as members of that institution in order to get from the legally I ought to do it to simply I ought to do it. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. And so, so let us go back to the cell. So, cell is the example of economics, right? So, this paper, we all decide in this uh, room that it's going to have a value, exchange value. So, we're going to exchange it for things. So, I create this paper and I exchange it for um, professor's um, or, or, or a computer or for his um, mobile. There's a difference between me giving value to this paper and saying, for example, that um, euthanasia, we ought not to implement euthanasia, or that they are human rights, isn't it? So there's a difference between the conventionality of something we agree on, this ought, the internal ought of, of an economics, for example, uh, of rationality, of exchange of a currency, and the ought of the law, isn't it, or not? I mean... So it's a little muddled, I think, by using the economic example, because, yeah. because on the one hand, with the economic example, you have the fact that the bill that the that the piece of money is the store of value. That's all conventional. Yeah. That people have desires um, of for things and that they want to exchange things in order to accomplish that. The basis of economics, it's not itself conventional, right? So the mere fact that I know I have something of value, you have something that I want, and there's a chance that we can exchange things so that we both are better off. That's not a conventional thing. What's conventional is that we are coming up with a medium to facilitate that. So the particular medium is conventional, but the need for a medium is potentially not conventional, depending on whether you agree with that theory of economics or not. So here, law is the paper or the the need in economic theory. So uh, what is the parallel? That's really good. Yeah, yeah. So the law is a tool. So it's the it's the fact that it's a tool. It's a tool for um, doing the exchange. So it's closer to the paper. But I would say so. So the best way to explain it would be to say that the law is currency, and therefore the particular rules or a particular legal system would be the paper in this analogy. And the law is the idea of currency in the analogy. So the, the idea of currency is the thing, in a sense, that gives you a mechanism for accomplishing this pre-conventional um, need for exchange. So the law may have a pre-conventional value, and I'm not saying it doesn't, but that the particular way in which we, in we, we use it is this kind of... Um, you know, based on imbuing it with these functional meanings and things like that, these conventional meanings. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Julieta uh, wants to say something. Well, me again. Thank you very much for. <laughs> yeah. 
for your ideas. I have a lot of questions, but I think I have only three brief ones. So the first, the first question is that, are you in some sense suggesting some kind of fragmentation of practical reasoning with this idea of um, disconnecting the explanation of legal normativity to then the question about legitimacy, for example, of the institution? This would be a first question. The second question would be, um, when you talked about the statuses and all the things that um, the consequence of this ascribing of the statuses, I was thinking about maybe something related to Robert Brandon's explanation of normativity. Do you think that your approach should be um, close to this pragmatic view of uh, normativity that, for example, Brandon's offer? And the third brief question would be, when you talk about, when, um, when you talk about, for example, the question of legitimacy of the institution, and you say, okay, um, there should be a reason for you or for the individual to embrace the institution. Is this here a reason as an objective reasons, reason for action or a belief in the, in the existence of a reason for doing that? Thank you very much. Great. Um, so I'm going to try to answer the last two and then I'm going to ask you to clarify what you meant by fragmentation. So going in reverse order, it's an objective reason. So, um, at least in my view, there are objective reasons and they're not just a reason. Re First of all, they're not reasons for belief. They're reasons for belief. It's for action. Um, they're reasons for action. Um, there may also be reasons for belief, but they're definitely objective. They're not just like what you happen to believe. Right? So, so you, there is a fact, I mean, I believe that normative claims are capable of truth values. And so there is a fact about what you ought to do will stop based on what reason requires of you. Now that um, best, what reason requires of you, since that's an objective, objective fact, that would imply that whether you ought to follow the law in any given case is dependent on whatever it is that legitimizes the claim of authority that the law says it has over you in that specific circumstance. And so that when it's true that it's legitimate and that it has authority over you, then there's that that's what allows you to get from legally I ought to drive under 120 kilometers an hour to I ought to drive under 120 kilometers an hour. So that's objective. If it's not the case that you have a reason to do what the law tells you to do there, um, it's not a, it's not a, an objectively true fact, then you just have the legally I ought to do it, which is still a descriptive fact about the history and the institution, but you don't have the you know the the bare fat the, the bare claim that I ought to do it. Um, as for Brandom's explanation, I, I'm not like off the top of my head as familiar with this to be able to answer it completely. My sense is I'm not giving a pragmatic explanation of normativity, um, in the sense that um, I'm not trying to explain normativity itself. And if I was being pragmatic about it. I think I would have a hard time understanding how to get that off the ground um, because I would need some set of values that would be kind of the the ultimate values towards which the normativity would be aiming. So they would be it suggests some sort of instrumentalization of the values. And so if I would need to understand more about what the ultimate values are that they're aiming at, and I don't think normativity as a whole can really be explained that way. Um, because it's about the nature, it, it go, it's coming into the nature of value itself. And so it's not something that can be simply instrumentalized in the way that, you know, like it enhances, let's say, survivability or enhances the species, or you're, you're having to already believe that something is valuable in order to get that off the ground. And so I think that would still be part of that. I'm not trying to explain normativity as a whole. I'm trying to explain how to get, um, you know, a certain kind of normativity, if you will, out of what appears to be just a bunch of social facts. So if I unpack those social facts enough, I'm seeing where one way to understand the Hume's point is to say you can't have an argument from is is to an ought without smuggling the ought into the into the premises somewhere. So what I'm trying to do is unpack 
the premises, unpack these social facts enough to find out where the oughts are hiding, if that makes sense, right? Um, and so that's why it's not an account of normativity itself, because I'm assuming, you know, oughts go in and oughts come out, and we can still debate about what the nature of those oughts are, what the nature of oughts in general are. Can you just explain a little bit more about what you meant by fragmentation, though, because I didn't quite get that. Okay, uh, yes. First, thank you very much for the answers of the other questions. So when I was thinking about fragmentation, I was thinking because when you explained your position, I I really don't want to circle back to Finney's, but I thought about Finney's position. For example, when he says that, okay, you can have a full uh, reasoning about um, what you ought to do and in the middle having, for example, a legal provision or a legal norm. But then you can fragment in this sense this reasoning and you can have only the two last premises and that conclusion would be a legal ought. But to go to a moral ought or a full-blooded ought or a robust ought, you have to have the first premise. That would be in your case, for example, I think, um, the question about the legitimacy of the authority for, or, or the institution in a wide sense. So what I was trying to to ask if was if you were thinking about something like this, or if you were proposing a true fragmentation of practical reasoning in the sense of that you can have the context of reasoning uh, regarding to a legal oath absolutely disconnected to um, a context in which you are talking or trying to talk about, for example, moral oath. That was uh, what I was trying to ask. Thank you. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. I need to think a little bit more about it. My first reaction when you were presenting it was to agree, yes, I'm okay with fragmentation. But then towards the end, I started feeling more uncomfortable about it. Um, and I think the reason is that um, it has to go back to what I said about the the way in which the the nature of the artifact is a kind of expressed or communicated desire, or like a request, right? And so there is it, it's so so it's a partial fragmentation, but the only the, the the only norm that comes out of the nature of law being an artifact is that it is um it's a very weak kind of norm in the sense that doesn't demand much of you, which is when the person makes the artifact, they want you to recognize what they're making as a member of the kind of thing that they're trying to make. So when they make a chair, they're not telling you, oh, please sit on my chair. I really want you to sit on my chair. I mean, they might tell you that, but what they want really in a sense is they, they're, I made this thing, recognize it for what I intend it to be, which is that it's a chair. So when the legislature makes a law, the analogy would be to to talk about the validity of the law. They're attempting to make the law a member of the legal system. And um, it, so we have a strong norm as long as they fa followed all of the procedural rules to set it up. And that gives its institutional status. So there's an interplay there. We have a strong norm to recognize that it's a law. So that is not fragmented. But the broader question of whether you should follow the law is still there's still a wedge there between, you know, the mere fact that it's law doesn't necessarily give you a reason to follow it. Rather, the mere fact that it's a law just gives you a reason to recognize that it's legally valid, that it's a member of the system, right? So I can't just say, in a way, it's a way of saying, look, no matter how bad the law is, you still say it's a law. You don't just say, oh, well, that's a, we're not going to recognize that that counts as a law, you know? So in a way, it's a it's a weird way of saying that the artifact part of the theory is actually also supporting, in a way, uh, a, a legal positivist picture. So there's a kind of metaphysical argument for a legal positivist picture, which I haven't really drawn out yet before now, that actually comes out of the, the nature of the normativity that's going in there. But, um, but I think that's to say it's partially fragmented and partially not fragmented. Okay, our students, uh, freshmen. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, hello. Uh, first of all, you've been kind of um, repeating the same motive of a chair, using it, using it as an analogy. 
And for me, it kind of evoked that this theory because he uses a table as an analogy as to explain why we have to do something because it serves a certain purpose. And I would kind of like to reflect on that as to explain my comment. Um, Wagner specifically presents a table as a cultural concept that we, in our heads, kind of um, says the purpose of serving human humans, even though it doesn't even closely encompass what table, <laughs> but <laughs> what table kind of uh, serves in its specific, in specific descriptions, as in like different materials, different heights of the table. But then again, Badwerk kind of puts all of that aside and brings to this conclusion that table is described as a complex of general descriptions or descriptors that has, again, that main purpose of serving humans. And just because it serves humans, then we ought to do something or use it in a way because it kind of links back to our higher purpose in a way. And then from the whole analogy, he draws a simple, let's say, definition of law as, again, general um, precept for living together of people that kind of serves that main goal of justice. And again, then we see that people do certain things. In this case, they obey the laws because they they believe in that moral, high moral sense and this sense of justice. Again, I do recognize there are some limitations to his theory because there is never enough reason to obey a law. But I would kind of like to see what your opinion is of his theory because I can recognize that there have been some repetitions of analogies that you use as well as he does. Thank you. Yeah, great question. So um, the first thing to say in reaction to that is the mere fact that someone makes a table, there's two things there. The fact that someone made a table doesn't give you a reason to use the table as they intended you to use it. So I can use the table to keep the door open, right? Now, that fact probably leads him to say, oh, well, you know, uh, it's not really that the function of the table is to put things on. The function of the table is to serve human purposes or something like that. So that's too general. I don't think that makes, a se makes sense because the way we use functions to is, is we use them. They're, they're a tool for carving up the world, right? I mean, we place the functions in the objects by making them and we classify things partially by their functions. And so if we start saying, well, the fact that I could use the table for something else means I shouldn't say it's for putting things on. I should just say it's for human for human usage or something like that. Well, and you're not you're not getting anything out of the idea of a function anymore. You're just giving up and you're just saying it's something that's useful. I mean, anything useful doesn't mean that it's thereby, you know, you're explaining it in terms of its function. So instead, what I like to say is, OK, the fact that I can use any particular table as a doorstop to pull open a door doesn't change the fact that the general function of tables, or as we call it, the proper function is to put things on. Now, how does that square with what I said before about the law? Well, this goes very closely to what I was saying a second ago about legal validity. The fact that I'm using the table to hold open the door doesn't mean it stops being a table. It's still a table, even as it's holding open the door. So I have, there's, there's, when people make things, there are two norms that they are expressing to you. Two, two kind of norms are being, being made. One is, please recognize this as a member of the kind of thing it is. That's hard to get away from. It's hard to stop seeing it as a table. I mean, I could start destroying it and eventually it stops being a table, but it's still a table even if I use it for something else. So the norm, I call it the norm of, 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 of identification or of recognition to evoke heart, right? The norm of identification is very strong because it's hard for it to stop being what it is but it doesn't require you to do very much. It just says, oh yeah, it's still a table. Somebody says, hey, what's that? You say it's a table. That The norm is pushing you to say it's a table. That's a very, it, it, you, we don't think of it in terms of norms, but it's a very kind of, because it doesn't require you to do much. The other norm is very, very weak usually, not always, but usually, right? The other norm is use it for what its purpose is. And because of the way in which these objects are made, it's very, it's very specific about what you're supposed to do with it. You're supposed to put things on it, 
but it's a very weak norm in the sense that it's very easy to overcome. As long as you need to use it to open the door, it's fine for you to use it to open the door. You don't have to put things on it. You can leave it to open the door. Now, there are some objects that have stronger norms of usage, right? So, for example, um, again, to go back to the example of flag law in the United States, right? Um, certain objects, especially ones that have cultural significance or symbolic you know, meaning or something like that, they're very, very, you know, there are stronger reasons not to use that in other ways. Like if you use the flag of your country to like, you know, um, as a doormat, right? So as something to wipe your feet on when you're coming in, you would be violating the norm of usage. And that's a much stronger norm of usage than let's say with a table. And it's because of the extra significance that's put into that. But it's still, even when you do that, it's very important that it's like even harder to avoid using it, avoid the norm of identification because everyone will recognize, oh my gosh, you're using the flag of your country as a doormat. That's like a powerful statement precisely because everyone recognizes the kind of thing it is. So I don't know if that completely answered your question, but I think that I'm resisting this idea that you can identify the, the, um, the, op, the, 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 the uh, that you can identify the function in such a general way. And even if it wasn't to be identified in such a general way, there isn't, it's very easy to overcome this norm of usage and use it for other things in general. Again, with some exceptions. Okay, last opportunity for one more question or comments. First time, second time, I'm sold. As I was already said, uh, the name of this conference or discussion uh, is Jam Jam Session. Jam Session. Um, by the way, I think that my my friend and colleague Miodra given this name. Am, am I right? Yes. Miodra likes to be funny and uh, smart guys, and <laughs> yes, sometimes, sometimes succeed. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, this discussion show, show that uh, it was a jam session, and as in the real jam session, uh, you you never see the end. Uh, okay, uh, but the end uh, has come. Uh, thank you all of our speakers. Thank you for all participants in discussion, and this is all, folks. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we're very grateful for your patience and questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Ken. Um, there is still, I think, uh, because you didn't make a pause, but uh, uh, there is, you ca we can still go for a short time. At least the other participants, <laughs> who are not the, the, the ones who spoke and organized the things, feel free to go to the uh, to the how do we call it?